This is Donald Parham of the L.A. Chargers, and you're listening to Chargers Unleashed, part of the L.A. Football Network. Stay jiggy. Three, two, one. This is Chargers Unleashed Podcast. Here are your hosts, Dan Wolfenstein and Jake Hepp. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by UFC Fit and Temecula, Charger Bolt Family, Golden Road Brewery, Tick Pick, and My Bookie. Hello, darkness. Dan Wolkenstein, you and I got off this show last week with, it was right before Christmas. We were heading in, wishing everybody a happy holidays. Uh, you and I were very adamant last week that there would be, should be no excuses whatsoever that the Chargers should go in to Houston, regardless of COVID situations, and get a victory given what was on the line. Dan, I hope you had a Merry Christmas. I hope that everybody out there had a Merry Christmas. For all of us that went to bed saying, all I want for Christmas this year is a Chargers victory, all of us unfortunately woke up to the nightmare after Christmas. What the hell happened last week? There is really no lack of words to describe the frustration that is currently going on in Chargers fandom. Uh... It's inexcusable for what was on the line that the Chargers came out and performed the way they did. And the tension right now, now for the fact that the Chargers no longer control their collective destiny to go to the playoffs, and now that they are going to need some help, the frustration is palpable and rightfully so. Dan Wolkenstein, uh, I can't really put it any better than that. I turn it over to you. How are you, sir? Um, Life-wise, uh, I am doing okay. Uh Yes, Merry Christmas to everyone. Uh, Happy New Year's coming up. Look, that was as gut-wrenching of a performance and as bad of a loss as I've seen in years. Um, Granted, we can come up with a bunch of excuses. We can talk about COVID. We can talk about health. We can talk about being on the road, talk about whatever. Um, There is no excuses. There is no excuses. Now, there isn't. The Chargers absolutely laid an egg. And I think the team, coaches, fan base, everyone is pissed and frustrated and and disappointed. Um, I think fans who, you know, we're four and one, we're eight and five, and we're feeling all great about playoff aspirations. Back down to earth now. Currently, I believe in the ninth seed, outside looking in, looking at things like the Dolphins currently in the playoffs, the Bengals in the playoffs, Steelers not in there yet, but they potentially could be in. Uh, Raven, I mean, there's a cluster, and now we're left having to talk about why, why this was able to happen in such a pivotal week against the easiest opponent in our schedule the entire year. If there was one team the entire year, and Jake called it, although he did say he called it as a Tyrod revenge game, before the season started, how poetic would it be if the Texans beat the Chargers? Steve Haglin asked me in our uh, breakdown of all of our collective podcasts that we did with our roundtable, said, what, what loss would be the most surprising to you, Jake? And I said, it would have to be the Texans. And of course, that was when I believed that Tyrod Taylor would be playing this game because I believe it would have just been sweet, poetic justice and, you know, the type of thing that would normally happen to the Chargers if Tyrod Taylor was able to find a way to beat Justin Herbert. But that was that was just before the season started. I even messaged Steve Haglin and said, I blame myself for <laughs> for calling it that um, because, of yeah. course, something you. like this would happen. But you know what? Dan and I could vent our frustrations for the next hour all day. Um we probably end up be repeating ourselves and it would just kind of be a little bit of wash, rinse, repeat. What's really the reason why we are currently sitting at eight and seven. What is the 
biggest reason that the Chargers lost this game. And to be honest, there's a multitude of reasons, but Dan and I could talk about it all damn day until we're blue in the face. So what I do know is that rightfully so, there are a lot of messages currently that called into the Chargers Unleashed hotline after Sunday. And their frustrations right now are more important than Dan and I's. So we're going to basically turn this show over to the, our callers because there are a lot and we're going to try to get it as much done as we can today. But the frustration is now all based uh, on our callers' opinions because I know that they have a lot of grievances that they need to air out and we're going to answer some of these questions and uh, give feedback to some of these responses as best as we can. And in turn, Dan and I are going to be airing our own grievances. So it's going to be you know, killing two birds with one stone essentially here. So Dan... I don't want to waste any more time on this. Uh, no. Let's get right to the first call. <laughs> Caller number one, as far as why you are pissed off today regarding the Chargers loss to the Houston Texans. Yes. Uh, Chargers Unleashed Hotline again, 323-374-5651. You can call us after every victory or defeat or any other time and give us your takes. We have about 10 voicemails. And so how this is going to go? Not surprised. We are going to play these and let folks give their reactions and you will drive the conversation for each of these comments. And then we'll go ahead and just get through these. This episode is just going to be us working through our feelings collectively, but also keeping it real. So first caller from the 570 area code. Let's hear what they had to say after the Chargers lose to the Texans. You know, I can't say I'm that surprised. I really can't. We've done this for years. I mean, years. I don't know how long other people have been a fan of this team, but this is actually my 17th year being a Chargers fan. So I've seen this over and over again, whether it's the Browns a couple of years ago we lost to, whether it's the Dolphins because we didn't have a kicker. Uh, we've done the Lions in 2014, huge Thanksgiving game or December game, whatever it was that we lost. We, we've done this for years. So I'm not surprised. But I am disappointed. Because Kenneth Murray, a guy that we traded up to get, is just useless. I'm sorry. I don't need to see more. He is not, he can't read the field as a linebacker. Okay. He misses tackles. He's athletic, sure, but he's not good on the edge either. In fact, he might be worse on the edge. And we traded up to get this guy. That's, that's just sad, right? Jerry Tillery, another guy. Yeah. He had the sack today or half the sack today. But he's just so horrible on run defense. He's so small. He gets moved off the point of attack so much for a first-round pick that it's just at this point he's only on the team because Telesco doesn't want to admit he missed, right? By the way, didn't love seeing Desmond King make a couple plays against us, a guy who I'm sure Staley would have loved to have, especially considering we have secondary issues with depth. But honestly, this game, my biggest takeaway is this is who the Chargers have always been. We've always been a team that's almost really good, but not quite. Almost, oh my God, the Chargers are finally here, but not enough, right? I mean, that's just who we always are. And until we get maybe a couple of years in this Staley regime, because I still believe in Staley, I still believe in Justin Herbert, and I still think that hopefully we can address the death issues that we have, but until we get a couple of years, I, we're, we're still the Chargers, right? Also, I want to say one thing. Uh, I saw some Chargers fans talking about Herbert making uh, the interception. You know, it's hilarious to me that people criticize Herbert for these types of interceptions, right? And they also criticize Rivers for those type of interceptions. But they'll be the same people that will praise Rivers in that last press conference he had. Oh. Did it cut out there, Dan? Remember where he said, you know, I ain't quitting. So if it means an interception on fourth and six, I'm not quitting because that's the type of person he is. Now they're going to criticize him. I think that's hilarious. Listen, they did the same thing for like 16 years. They're trying. That's all you can ask. Bolt up. Wow. Lots Lots of feelings. To unpack. Lot to unpack there. Um, Dan, if I miss anything here from my my recap of that call, just just let me know. Okay, so where to start? Crying out loud. Uh, let's start with K9. <laughs> Let's start with Kenneth Murray. Um, Dan, I really don't know what to say about this because 
I even I had to tweet out a very very poor play by Kenneth Murray, and all I said was "My God," that's all I said. Um, and it was the play where I believe it was Burkhead running to his side, and just the containment by Murray on that particular play. He just had no idea where he was supposed to be, and it looked embarrassing for him. Um, I don't really understand. And again, I know that this intrigued a little bit of us and we can understand why based off of the play from Drew Tranquil and Kaiser White, where we collectively say that both of those guys are playing that position better than Kenneth Murray currently right now. And that he was essentially forced out of his natural position in which the Chargers drafted him for that. They said, you know what? We're going to go ahead and just try him at edge. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, Did that. It, it is shown that that has not worked. Again, nobody should have expected a huge, you know, production aspect from him uh, in that circumstance. But it looks really, really bad right now. So, uh, look, I know that he's not your first, second, third, or even your fourth option, really, as far as edge rusher goes. Yes, the Chargers were depleted because of COVID issues, but I'm not making that excuse here. Kenneth Murray had a very, very bad game. And against a team that had three of its five offensive linemen out, a team that had not had 100 yards rushing since week one against the Jacksonville Jaguars, of course they decided to, to do it against us. Um, I really don't know what you do with Kenneth Murray right now, Dan, because Kenneth uh, Kaiser White has proven to be a fantastic commodity for this defense. Drew Tranquil has proven that. We all figured that Kenneth Murray in the this defense under Brandon Staley was going to be able to find that next level. And, you know, he flashed at that position at times last year, and we felt like this was going to be his opportunity to take the next step. But when you see that he's essentially been replaced almost as a starting inside linebacker, when you moved up in the draft in the first round to take him, you better find some way to put Kenneth Murray in a position to be productive. Let me move quickly to Jerry Tillery. Look, Jerry Tillery um, has never really been good against the, the rush defense. So that should surprise nobody. That's even going back to his time at Notre Dame. He wasn't drafted for that. He was drafted for his ability, ability to get to the passer. Yes, he had one sack yesterday, but overall it was not one of his better days. And with Justin Jones out, Guys like Joe Gaziano out, obviously Joey Bosa out. He was not able to pick up the slack next to Linval Joseph yesterday. Um, and overall, in terms of just surprise aspects, Dan, this felt like an old school type of Chargers loss where when the Chargers have a must-have scenario and almost like a gift-wrapped scenario to where even with the COVID issues, the Chargers are a much more talented team in this circumstance, especially going up against the replacements, essentially, that Houston had to feel out, field out there. But is that true? Is that true? Like, let's just call Spade a Spade for a second. So the, the I'm, glad, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said that because are they top heavy? Yes. And their depth with ex was exposed. And I'm sure we're going to be getting into the criticism of Tom Telesco because there is some that's definitely warranted here. But I, I thought about that, and I thought about a quote from Miracle, where Kurt Russell says, you're not talented enough to win on talent alone. And that was the truth in this particular game. Because we could say, yes, without a doubt, even, even regardless of the COVID issues, the Chargers are the more talented team because you look at Justin Herbert and you look at the magic that he could do. Yeah, but... Keenan Allen seeing one of his lowest target outputs of the entire season against the decimated Houston defense. You know, you still have issues with, with Jared Cook. I felt like Josh Palmer, even though he got a late garbage time touchdown, was going to be much more heavily involved. This looked like a team that was coached by Anthony Lynn and had a defense that was coached by Gus Bradley. No heart. That's that's what that looked like. You look bad. Like, literally, your, your star players in that game were Justin Jackson. 
Is that it? How much more can you go? Is that it? Because there wasn't really any. Like, like Herbert, Herbert was okay. He wasn't terrible. He was okay. The one interception was bad. The other interception, the second one, I don't think was on him. I think Jared Cook just stopped. But like he wasn't bad. Justin Jackson, I think, was the only one. Even he fumbled. So that was a bad call. It, it, was, it was just it was a bad day. Not a bad call. Bad day. Um next one, Jay. We've got a bunch of these here. Next one from the 858 area code. Let's see what they have to say. What's up, Chargers Unleashed? Uh, this is Corey Comments. Uh, listen every week. I love you guys. Um, devastating loss. Devastating loss. Yeah, we got to beat the 3 and 11 team. The thing I've been thinking about is Justin Herbert. He looks a little like he doesn't have the drive at the beginning of the game. Why does it always seem like he can pick it up at the end of the game, but not bring it there at the beginning of the game? <sighs> I'm still trying to process this shit. Much love. Hope you guys can recover from this. Long- you know, I mean, I, I could, I could understand uh, the frustration of that. I, I don't fully agree necessarily with Justin Herbert not picking it up at the beginning of the game because we've seen Justin Herbert do that plenty of times. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what I can get behind though, and I know a lot of people were asking about this, is that especially coming off of the kansas city game when everybody was saying take the field goal take the points and brandon staley stood by and defended his position on why he kept going for it on fourth down because he knew who the quarterback was on the opposite side so his his goal while obviously to win the game at the end of the day was also to put up points and to force kansas city to almost become a a one-dimensional team and they had to play catch up make them do it and then you get to this game, Dan. In the first couple of drives, they Staley really pulled back the reins. Now, I get it. The quarterback <laughs> deficiency and the difference between Patrick Mahomes and Davis Mills is a freaking universe at this point. But you almost wonder to yourself, well, if you were living and dying by your aggressiveness just one week ago and you stood by it, and I understood his reasonings for standing by it, why against a 3-11 and team especially given your issues on COVID and how much your defensive secondary was decimated by that. And how important this game was. <laughs> Why would you not keep the same mentality of that aggressiveness? Now, the only the only thing I would say is I'm pretty confident Brandon Staley did not think that they would need to be putting up 42 points to score. And I can understand why he, yes, I can understand why his thought process of that was. Which even that is is vomitous a word like the chargers gave up 41 points i granted seven of those were from a pick six 34 points to the houston texans other than rex could you name another guy davis mills kind of but like no that offense is horrible they'll tell you that offense is horrible and the chargers defense just got absolutely shredded all day they could not get one stop the Chargers offense honestly like they did okay they did okay they needed the defense to get one stop and the defense couldn't do it to save their life in that fourth quarter they the offense were in it when they needed to be but then they just couldn't get the ball back and that by the time they got the ball back they're already down two three scores game over Um, I think this was I think this was I, I forgive me if I'm forgetting who it was that actually tweeted it may have been popper Dan but Statistically, as a group, as a metric, as far as taking in all of accounts, this was the worst defensive performance by the Chargers since, ready for it, 2014, when you went up against a then Peyton Manning-led Denver Broncos team. And you're up against Rex. That is is the... That is the defensive performance that you put together against a rookie quarterback and a Rex Burkhead led rushing attack. I think Rex Rex Burkhead had just in the neighborhood between 200 and 300 yards rushing on the season (laughs) and almost had 200 in one single game and put it in the end zone twice. Yes, the Chargers were down a bunch of guys, but so were the Texans. The Texans were down more guys. Now, arguably, the Chargers were down more important guys. But 
you just cannot look like that against the Texans. You just can't, period. And everyone, you know, talked about this being a, a frustrating loss. Um, look, this one, this one hurt everyone. And it just, it's hard, it's hard to not give up when you see performances like this. And imagine how the players feel. Like imagine the coaches after this. Like they could just yeah. phone it in. Like it sucks. But we're going to get into some of the scenarios and kind of where we're at with kind of the the playoff seedings and what needs to happen and stuff later on. But again, like we're just going to kind of keep rolling with <laughs> these emotions here. Uh, another one looks like it's a long one. So strap in uh, from the 917 area code. Let's hear what they have to say. Hi guys, I'm calling after the Texans game to fucking embarrassing performance that we just put out there. Um, first off, I'd like to say, uh, bolt up, of course, uh, bolt up boys. Uh, Thank you. It's going to be a tough season and we're probably not going to make the playoffs after that fucking performance. But first off, we need Chargers fans to start type taking or looking for some accountability within the organization. For fucking seven to ten years, since we've had Philip Rivers, since we have what's called, we're the biggest chaos fucking organization ever. We still can't get our shit together on fourth down, on, on not on fourth down, on anything. We can't get our shit together in the fourth quarter, is what I mean. We fucking consistently blow leads. We can't handle anything. And our roster has been shit since 20 fucking 13, and we've done nothing about it. We've lucked into multiple picks. Tom Telesco lucked into Joey Bosa because Jameis Winston and Jar uh, Jameis Winston and Ma or Mariota and Jared Goff went, whoever the fuck it was. He lucked into fucking Derwin James dropping the 17. He fucking missed on a bunch of other fucking picks, moving up to Kenneth Murray. And thank God the fucking Miami Dolphins didn't take Justin Herbert, or else he'd be fucking gone. Also, next up. Start focusing our fucking efforts on getting JoJo Woodson out. No fucking Chargers counts talk about it. No one fucking mentions it. But JoJo Woodson has been the director of player personnel for fucking since 2013. And yet no one brings up his name at all. He's just as fucking in, uh, should be held accountable as Tom Telescope. He's in charge of the roster. He's in charge of monitoring free agents monitoring for agents throughout the season. So if players get hurt, players go down, we can sign or maybe trade or do things like that. Yet he does fucking nothing. It's an embarrassment. It actually is an inept embarrassment that he continues to be at the helm of that thing. He's a joke. It's an actual joke that I have to sit here and watch this shit over and over and over again. All the fucking people on Twitter are calling for Staley's head and it's bullshit. What the fuck do you want the guy to do? Go out there and make the tackles himself? No. He's uh, I pause it for a sec. He's in his feelings. Um, quick timeout, Jake. Jojo, uh, do you feel this is a personnel issue to where Telesco slash him should be called into question? Because this is the same personnel folks that got, you know, Nazir Adderley, that have Asante Samuel Jr., that have a bunch of guys that are performing well. Granted, again, Folks did not play this game. Like, the free agents of Corey Lindsley wasn't there. Matt Filer has been out a lot. Not necessarily this game. Brian Belaga was a bad pickup. Like, there's a bunch of guys. Ode Boucher, who they signed. Like, a bunch of guys that were very good pickups or picks are not playing. Do you think it is a personnel issue? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it's not the only issue. There's multiple issues, but... It I knew we were going to get to Tom Telesco in a minute because I know that there has been a lot of criticism in the last few couple of days, specifically when you look at the depth, when the chargers are really top heavy with talent and when it's stripped away, you see that this is what's left. I think, um, you know, we could go back into the whole free agency period and criticize those, whatever you want to. Has Tom Telesco missed on every one of them? No. Some of them have actually been on very beneficial. I was uh, very proud of their offseason this year, to be honest. You know, you, you mentioned Brian Bulaga. That hasn't been what you have wanted it to be. Chris Harris, uh, from in terms from a, you know, from what you expected out of him, has, unfortunately, has not been what he, you wanted him to be. And, and there are others. And, um, I think when it came down to it, especially around the time that Asante Samuel Jr. went down, I think that there was no, there, there wasn't really a big push to do anything to help your defensive secondary like no or your interior. Plan, no defense. way to fortify yes. it just in case. 
Correct. Correct. It's just like, you know, it's okay. We're going to go with the guys we have. And while there's certain guys, you know, at certain positions, not all, but guys that you see, whether it's from the wide receiver class, whether it's some of the interior defensive lineman class, even that was a surprise to me because I was very critical of the interior defensive line depth before this season started. And of course, now it's really reared its ugly head again. But Brandon Fajoko has stepped up immensely. Uh, Joe Gaziano, in the limited amount of time that he's gotten a chance to play big, has played well. But when you look at it, it's like some of these guys, Tan, and we said this after it was the game that Tillery was out when Linval Joseph was out, and you're like, oh my God, here's the second and the third string guys for interior defensive linemen. And that was a game that they actually played well, mm -hmm. those guys. So you would be expecting better from your top guys. So yes, Jerry Tillery definitely has not turned out to be what you expected him to be. Kenneth Murray, we've already gone into that. I don't know what you make of this at this point, if this is I think, where your I will plan say, is Kenneth for Murray, the future. The Kenneth Murray thing, I think, is fully mental. Like I think, I think there's a mental hurdle. There are blocks there that he is thinking too much. You've seen it on some of the All-In episodes and some of the mic'd up episodes where fellow teammates are telling him, like, stop thinking and just go. Um, then, I mean, again, like I said, him making that switch to the edge position, nobody should have expected an immense amount of production from him, given that's not what he's known for. But in the offseason, you either need to put him in a position to where he could be successful or you need to dedicate yourself into fixing these mental mistakes. Like, for like a Brendan Hymas type where he's getting fixed before he comes up. That there's a, there's another one, you know. There's another one. It's the and we still haven't really gotten a chance that is, to. But there's a reason right, we're not getting a chance to see this. But there's a lot of potential there. So Tom Telesco to me has had has had good moments and bad moments as a GM in terms of personnel goes. Has there been opportunities for him to be more aggressive, whether it's during the free agency period or closer to the trade deadline? One hundred percent, there is. Um, nobody is going to forget this. And trust me, nobody is going to forget this until the draft is complete. And that is taking into the free agent uh, period window as well. This is the most critical off season for Tom Telesco. If Tom Telesco, if there was a hot seat for him. I was just going to ask you, hold on. I was just going to ask you this. How, and let's, let's finish this, let's finish this voicemail, but I'm going to leave this question for you to answer after the voicemail. Yeah. How hot is Tom Telesco's seat right now? I'll right have an now. answer for you. I'll have an answer for you. He can't fucking do that. His scheme's fine, and he's an aggressive, really good fucking coach. He's an up-and-coming coach, and I get that the old school heads won't like him, but it's perfect for the fucking new, new wave NFL. So everyone shut the fuck up about Staley, and we need to fix this fucking roster. There's thousands of fucking players out there all the fucking time yet we consistently put have aaf fucking players and xfl players as our fucking backups stop promoting from within and realize that our roster isn't that good we keep fucking viewing it from our side of the view so the front office looks at our roster and doesn't compare it to anyone fucking else and it's a joke it's a fucking joke they need to do something and people need to be held accountable and our fucking beat writers first off let's go to the beat writers now they have the stupidest fucking questions every fucking time when they when they have the ability to question staley any of them all that they ask no hard-hitting questions and they don't make them uncomfortable at all sucks to fucking sucks it comes with a job do it I don't give a fuck if your boss is telling you not to ask the hard-hitting questions because that's the and then cut off, by the way. Got it. <laughs> so that okay. was a three-minute long voicemail. All um, right. So to, to answer the last question, how hot is Brandon Staley on the hot seat right now? Uh, if we're doing like nine out of ten or one out of ten, it's a 9.5. It's a 9.5. Right now. Right now. Right now, no question about it. This is the so is there a, is there a legitimate chance that he could be fired this offseason? I don't think it's happening this offseason, but this is the most important off season for him as a GM of this team. Okay. okay. And I, I, I think that the leash will be extremely short throughout this off season. And of course, if things don't end up panning out, then trust me, you're going to be getting the brunt of it from the fan base next year. But with the cap space that the chargers are going to have available in the off season with the history that we know of, of, him with his draft picks, especially most notably in the third round, you really have to. And I, I won't 
go as far as to say that there is a rebuild needed for this team because there's not. But uh, you have to make sure that you're fortifying certain positions. You have to make the effort to strengthen the ones of need. Most notably, as we've seen recently, interior defensive line, cornerback most likely. I, you, you're going to need some type of more more uh, of, of uh, better edge production opposite Joey Bosa. And again, this is not taken into account because I'm not foreshadowing who's going to be here and who's not. We could talk about that on a different episode because obviously that's going to change everything. But this is the most important offseason of Tom Telesco's career. He's got, last he's got a year, ticket right now. Last year, it was all about the coaching hires and what he was able to do with the draft. And yes, getting Rashawn Slater was a lot of luck. Getting Asante Samuel Jr. was a lot of luck. I said mm-hmm. that there was no way in hell that that was possible. And somehow the football god smiled upon the Chargers in that circumstance. So Tom Telesco has so many things that he has to hit a home run for in this offseason to make sure that this team is going to be able to compete in the postseason. Because if you lose to a team like you just lost to in the Houston Texans, Dan, we've talked about trust a lot on this show previously. <laughs> how, do you, how do you have any trust that the Chargers are A, going to be able to win their next two games to get into the playoffs, not even thinking about anybody else of the, the help that you need outside of that. But if you do make it to the playoffs, what confidence level do you really have that you're going to be able to win in that first round? And right now it's very low. I appreciate the people that are standing by and say, hey, you know, let's just take this next game at a time. Let's get to the playoffs. Let's do what we need to do. But guess what? You forfeited your hold on the playoffs when you controlled your own destiny when you lost to a 3-11 and team. And now your back is against the wall. It's true. Let's keep it rolling, Jake. Charge and Leash Hotline, 323-374-5651. This one is sponsored by TickPick. You go to tickpick.com slash unleashed. You can get the cheapest tickets and cheapest prices for those tickets. Uh, Jake, one more home game against the Broncos. I'll be there. I got some friends coming. Uh, if you have a chance, if you have the opportunity to have that day to go see a football game, use it. Go to tickpick.com slash unleashed to get your tickets to the Chargers game and tickets to really any event, to be honest. Uh, next episode, Jake, we've got one from the 502 area code. Let's hear what they have to say. Yo, Chargers Unleashed, this is Los. Hey, I just watched that game against the Texans. Hey, I'm not really mad. I'm really okay. You know, first year head coach, second year quarterback, had a bunch of injuries. I don't know why everybody's tripping. All right? I'm down. Relax. Uh, if we don't go to the playoffs this year, it's going to be a bummer. But it's not the end of the world. The sky's not falling, all right? We still got a great team. We got 11 picks going into the draft. Calm down. The future is still here. Bulk up. All right. So I'm not necessarily going to say optimism has called, but someone who is kind of pumping the brakes on all of the, the nightmare scenarios here and kind of taking the long view and the perspective of what could be a good future. You mentioned it before, Jake, the Chargers have 11 draft picks and a basically blank check for any free agent that they want. I mean, they can get multiple, but if there was one that they were like, I got to give no matter what, they can give a blank check. This is a huge, huge offseason, and no one said this was the year. No one thought, at least rationally, Chargers are winning the Super Bowl this year. It just wasn't happening. Now, did we think that they would be better than a borderline playoff team? I would say a successful season would be them being in the playoffs and winning a playoff game. That would be a success. I would say getting to the playoffs and then losing would be like, ah. but not even getting in, I think, would not be a success. I, I think that we just call for what it is. No. Um, no, and I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Given how the season started, given the potential that we've seen for this team against tougher competition given the team we've teams we've beaten like come and, on right and where you positioned yourself up until this point and given yep. this the schedule the strength of schedule that you had remaining it would be an extreme disappointment if you were to not even even make the playoffs next one we're just keep rolling uh next one from the 610 area code i believe this is jim from pennsylvania 
see what they have to say. Jim from Pennsylvania. As a longtime Chargers fan, there's only one word to describe this week. Predictable. Thanks. You know, it's ahead, funny. Yeah, I, I used to say I used to say that term a lot. I just as just a year ago. Predictable. Whatever can happen will happen. You know, to take a to take a Stephen A. Smith line that he likes to give so much to the Cowboys, it's definitely very relatable to the Chargers as well. I actually would like to amend that and choose a different one. And for anybody that has seen Spider Way Spider Man No Way Home as of late, there is a great line that MJ gives during the movie where she says, "Expect disappointment, and you're never disappointed." Not to say that anybody expected this from this game against Houston, but Dan, I've talked to you in private about missed opportunities this year. The game, the week that the Chiefs had the bye, when you were going and playing Denver and you squandered mm-hmm. that game, you squandered the Minnesota game, you did what you did against Kansas City and losing that opportunity. And now this, which is just the ultimate coup de grace, the cherry on top of all the embarrassment that has taken place. It's just a season of missed opportunities when you see how good the Chargers started it off. And remember, everybody was saying, it's like, you know, the Chargers were in certain situations where it looked like it was that old cliche Charger situation. They're going to lose in that type of fashion again. And they found a way to win. And now, after those first six weeks, Dan, we said, this is the easiest part of our schedule. We got the hardest window out of the way. And since then, we have had to talk about more frustrating losses in classic Chargers fashion. And what else can you say about it? It's pathetic. It's disappointing. It's ridiculous. I will say this loss was like one of those PTSD type losses where you're just like, oh, this feels too familiar. Um, And it hurts, man. It hurts. And I think that's what, again, this whole episode, we're just going to get out our feelings, let it all out. Uh, I think this is part of the healing process. Uh, We have a right to be frustrated, have a right to be upset. And all of that is just. Um, so let's just keep it going. 909 area code. Let's hear what they have to say about the Chargers' loss. What's going on, fellas? I'm from Victorville here. Um, this is pressing Sunday night. Um, took an L from a 3 and 11, now 4 and 11 team. Uh, given the circumstances, yeah, you know, we got hit by COVID rather roughly, but every team deals with it week to week. Uh, no excuse. I mean, people could blame the coaching, people could blame players. I mean, I think this is just a, a, a mix up of just years and years of not drafting well and not having quality depth players. Um, so, I mean, it is what it is. We got to stay positive. Um, this season has been filled with ups and downs. Uh, it's been great. Um, I like where we're heading, but uh, what do you guys think our chances are? Uh, Landing a, a wild card spot, man. I mean, it's going to be tough. Uh, we have to win out, and we need some help from the, some other teams losing. But uh, what do you guys think? And uh, how do you guys feel about Kenneth Murray on the edge? And then uh, why do you think we're so stagnant on offense? Uh, look forward to hearing uh, from you guys. Hope all is well. Hope you guys had a good uh, Christmas. And uh, yeah, man, look forward to hearing from you guys. All right, so Jake, so two questions that have not been answered yet. Uh, playoff chances. Do you think there's a possibility? And then why is our offense stagnant? Uh, the floor well, is yours. if the Chargers did what they were supposed to do on Sunday, I'd feel fantastic about our playoff chances. They co- they controlled their destiny to get either the fifth or the sixth seed, depending on what happened with the teams a- ahead of them. Now, at best, you're looking at the seventh seed. If you can take care of business these next two weeks and go out, get victories against Denver and Las Vegas, and with the teams remaining ahead of you that you need to drop at least one of their final two games, um, the Ravens play the Rams, which that will not be an easy game for them. Then they have Pittsburgh the week after that, a divisional game of also a team that's trying to make the playoffs. So, then, then, real quick, so the, te- the teams ahead of them right now currently in the playoffs for wild card are the Ravens, the Bills, the Dolphins. and the Dolphins, the Dolphins, correct? Those are the two you want to concentrate on right now as far Ravens as just getting, just getting into the seventh seed spot. 
Okay. So you need the Ravens to either drop one against the Rams or the Steelers. I think that that's totally possible. And the Dolphins have games against the Titans and the Patriots. Again, both teams playing for their playoff seating position. So it's a realistic option that the Chargers or that those two teams could drop at least one of theirs. But like I said earlier, Dan, how much confidence do you have? Do you trust that the, them? That the Chargers can go out and get these next two victories? I I don't, Dan. I, I, I don't do. Okay, I do. I think believe that, that they one can of those. Get... I do think one of those teams, if not probably both of those teams, are going to lose one of those games. I do believe that's going to happen. I can but, believe that. But as far but as do the, I, but like do I business? Do I trust the Chargers on the seventeenth game to go don't into Vegas? Don't say it. Like, I don't know. I, I, I have no clue. And that's one of the things we said about this team all year is we don't know who this team is. They can go toe-to-toe with the Chiefs and then lose to the Texans. Right. The, it, it's just, this it doesn't, team it doesn't make collectively sense. has no identity. And, and yes, I know Brandon Staley in the best way possible without naming any names called out the defense. And mm-hmm. said in all three facets we played horrible today, and he was very more he was very specific uh, into what he was meaning by that. Again, without calling any names, that was probably the best way that Coach Staley could could place accountability mm-hmm. on these players. Yep. But yeah, Dan, I don't have confidence in it. I don't, considering that you've already lost to Denver once from playing two quarterbacks that collectively only completed fifteen passes against you. And a defense that I know always comes to play you tough. And for the fact that we already know some of the players that we're going to be without this week due to COVID, i.e. Mike Williams, Chris Harris, Nasir Adderley, on top of the ones we haven't gotten back yet. Yeah, I don't feel confident about it. And even if you get past that, now you're talking about a basically a playoff possible scenario because both the Chargers and the Raiders could be playing for their playoff lives in that circumstance. So now the stakes have just been amped up even more in that circumstance. So the, the pressure is on the Chargers to take care of their business first and foremost and hope that they get help along the way. So if you're asking what are the chances are for me right now, they're slim. There, Okay, I will say this. There is a good likelihood that the Chargers have an opportunity to get in the playoffs. But the only way that happens if the Chargers win both games, do we honestly think that's... I mean... Given what we've seen so far, the chances of that are not great. Now, could they do it? Sure. But, like, let's be real. Th- this it's it's be- easy to say that you can do it. And this is us getting back into the whole, you know, when you look at the roster, talent, on paper, yep. that dreaded quote that we've hated saying, Dan, on mm. paper, are the Chargers more talented than the Denver Broncos and the Raiders? At a lot of key positions, yeah, they are. So can they do it? Yes. But do you trust them to do it? That's the real question. And right now, I don't know how you can say yes. You want to believe they can. But do you trust that they can? If you had to put your entire savings account on them winning or losing <laughs> the next two games. I wouldn't. <laughs> I'll, I'll All take right, a more, last one. Uh, I'll take a better zero area code. Um, Again, this is all about venting. We're going to get into like the specifics and all that jazz later. But right now, we're just going to get all our feelings out. Five four zero. Eric could give us our last one. This one came in whew, late Monday night, Jake. Let's hear what they had to say about this game. Hey, both up, guys. Uh, hope everybody's doing well in spite of a pretty crazy, disappointing game. Um, I just wanted to throw a little thought in here. I keep hearing a lot of talk about the uh, lack of depth provided by uh, Tom Telesco as being one of the factors in the loss of this game. And, yeah, I can see maybe we had some players that were out of kilter, but I have a question on that. Um, During the offseason, they had a selection process, and I believe the players that they had, they had chosen for the 53-man the uh, roster was talented enough. I mean, these guys had uh, school records that were high in caliber. So, and my fault, Tom Telesco provided the weapons. His scouting staff provided the weapons. 
these guys were selected by a coaching team to say, hey, look, we've got our best foot forward. Um, did this system take the weapons that were provided and coach this team to where worst case scenario, if there was a great big falling away by the fact of the injury plague hitting them, were they ready to take a near second team, be able to get on that field and be competitive? I don't really blame Tom Telesco for not providing the pieces. I kind of feel like this coaching staff hopefully has learned their lesson and will begin to take the pieces they chose and get them more prepared to be able to compete in the NFL. Anyhow, that's my fault. Anxious to hear how you guys feel about it. Uh, bolt up. Love the Chargers. Love the nation. You guys have a great new year. Appreciate right. that call. Um, okay, so let me let me kind of try to summarize everything to do is break it down. So let me start with Staley. So he believes that it was Staley's – Staley needed to be more accountable for the loss against Houston than Tom Telesco did. Okay. So number one, right out of the gate, Staley gets a little bit – of an out considering the fact that he's in his first year of head coaching. Okay. It's not, it's not a lot. It's just a little bit of an out, but on top of that, uh, I think Staley did learn a lesson after this game. You could tell from his, his post game press conferences, how disappointed he was um, as opposed to other coaches that we have heard that we have heard just basically give a lot of fluff after some really disappointing losses. Uh, I didn't see any of that from Staley's press conference. I think he took accountability uh, from himself on how he coached. He even said it himself. I did not coach this team up and have them prepared enough for this game. So he took accountability for himself. And as I said a minute ago, he, in the best way possible, called out his defense as far as their poor play, despite who was on the field. Because regardless of COVID, Houston was going through the same two, and you would still say that the Chargers still should have had the more talented team for who was out there on defense and should have been able to beat a Houston Texans team that at that time was three and eleven. So I still come back to this, and I still I still put more of the blame on Tom Telesco in this circumstance. And for those of you who want to go out and say, come back with the easy notions of saying, you know, the hashtag fire Staley or fire Telesco, regardless of the the fire Telesco one, may be a little bit more warranted at this time, given what we're talking about. But you know what? Don't just grab for the low hanging fruit, please. Stop this fire Staley stuff. If you know, if you're, you're going to, you know what? I'll tell you this. If you want to say that, that's fine. That's your opinion. But give me a realistic solution on what you would rather have. Thank because you. if you look at the head coaches, because I've seen some people saying that the Chargers need an established head coach to coach their team to be better. They've tried that in the past, and it didn't work out. If we thought that after getting rid of Norv Turner and hiring Mike McCoy, that things were going to get better, was a first-time head coach. They thought after getting rid of Mike McCoy and hiring Anthony Lynn that things were going to be better. It didn't. Now, look at if you look at the head coaches, let's not forget who was hired during this offseason at certain coaching spots. Brandon Staley came to the Chargers. Nick Sirianni went to the Eagles. Dan Campbell went to the Lions. Arthur Smith went to the Falcons. Robert Sala is coaching the Jets. David Culley coaching the Texans. And how could we forget Urban Meyer and the Jacksonville Jaguars? And Dable still with, with Buffalo. I will take Brandon Staley, no question, out of that list, given the output of what is being performed from those other teams, no question. So I'm not going to say that you can't say fire Staley. But don't just say fire Staley. If, if we all love to be armchair GMs, which we do every single week, and we think that we know better than anybody else in the football personnel, then give me more than just fire Staley and tell me what you would do. Tell me your solution to, get, to make this team better rather than just say fire Staley. Give me something else other than that. If you want to say fire Telesco, I've said he is on the hot seat no more than what he is this upcoming season. And if given what he's got in cap space and in draft capital this year, <sighs> if he is not able to capitalize, then I may be joining those who are saying that. So I'm not far off, but of all the criticism that has come out of Staley and Telesco, while for this particular game, it's warranted more bigger picture for Tal Telesco because the depth was really exposed and it's, and it's, 
the Chargers can't go into every season just top heavy at each position if they plan to make a long run in the playoffs. Given their aspects, obviously, with this year of COVID and then with their injury history as well to certain key players, you have to build a better team and have a team coached better at a lot of different other depth pieces. Yeah, so there's so there's a couple things. And, and I think this is the part that we're probably going to unpack a lot as we kind of continue out throughout the week. Is is this Chargers A team? In my opinion, I believe Chargers A team can go up against any other squad in the NFL, and I'll take our chances. I like us. If you have, if we have a healthy Chargers squad on both sides, I'm game. Now, B squad, I think we can put up a fight as long as we got Justin. I think we can put up a fight. But if we have to go into it with the C squad, like when we have arguably like seven of our 10 best players not playing in a game, this team is not equipped. It just isn't. Roster-wise, it's just not. And is that a Telesco issue? You can say a little bit, sure. Is it a coaching issue previously, like before Staley? Probably. Like Staley and company can only do so much in one season. In my opinion, Brandon Staley has completely flipped the narrative in terms of Chargers playing passively and now able to play aggressive and Chargers having that mentality of kind of going out and playing it their way and not playing to lose. Like, I think they've taken a lot of that and put it aside. Now, has it worked all the time? No, not, not really. But has it, has it changed the mindset? Yes. The Chargers have 11 draft picks. We're not getting in a draft mode yet, but the Chargers have 11 draft picks and an offseason with a coach who I will take to coach up a team. This isn't all going to happen overnight, but like th there were some weaknesses on this team that was exposed. Like we talked about how bad the offensive line was, and that was like number one priority. Like the Chargers went out and fixed that, and then what happens? Like three of them are out for the year. Like, there's only so much you can do about that stuff. Uh, corners, like they they went out, they let, now I think they did let go of one too many last year, but like they went out and got Osati Samuel Jr. He's been out with a concussion for like a month. Like what do you, Rashawn Slater goes out. Corey Lindsley goes out. Derwin James is out. Keenan Allen's out. Mike Williams out. Eckler's out. Like there's so many guys you can't expect. Like when all those guys are, at, are out, you can't expect a top tier talent from the guys remaining. And again, should the Chargers have lost versus the Texans? In no world should they have lost that game. But the difference in talent of this Chargers squad versus this Texan squad as it stood on Sunday is not nearly as much as we want to think. It just isn't. It just isn't. And that team... I think was coached up more and wanted that game more, showed more heart and wanted that fourth win more than we wanted a playoff berth, which is really sad, sad. And, and hard to accept. But like, that's the case. You did not see much from this Chargers team. And I don't know if they just thought they were going to come in, roll in and whoop up on them because they only had three wins. Like that's just not the NFL. Good teams lose to bad teams all the time. It just happens, and that's what happened, unfortunately. Like, the Bills have lost, I think, to the Jaguars. The Texans lost to the same – or, excuse me, the Titans lost to the Texans. The Cardinals have lost to the Lions. Like, good teams lose to bad teams every game of Sunday. But that was the worst time to be having to learn that lesson. And all of us are having to sit here and just wonder, like, is it too late now? Is it too late? Like, do you, do you think this season is over, Jake? Is it too late? Dan, I, I like I said, I don't have a lot of trust and confidence that this Chargers team is going to be able to even take care of their business alone. I have more confidence that Miami and Baltimore will lose one of their last two games. But how can you trust this team right now, given the effort in games that you've put out against Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Kansas yeah. City? And then to see them do something like this, where they knew where they were at, they knew what was on the line, and against one of the worst teams that was riddled more by COVID issues than you were, 
you gave up one of your worst defensive performances in franchise history to a terrible team to a terrible team their offense sucks like so starting offense sucks from the top down whether it's telesco and the depth really showing out whether it's staley admitting and taking accountability that he did not his have his guys prepared to play to overall execution from the players themselves how how do you trust this you know if this was the third or the fourth game of the season it, it probably wouldn't hold this much weight because you could say, okay, like, look, while it would mm-hmm. still suck, you still have plenty of time to right the ship. Look what the hell the Miami Dolphins have done this year. They started off one and seven and have gone off on a seven game winning streak and are now in playoff contention as it stands right now ahead of the Chargers. So you have these losses that, you know, it, 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 it always happens every single year. But it's when it happens and what's on the line when it happens that really, truly matters. And for this taking place with four games remaining to when the Chargers went into Houston and did this, or excuse me, with three games remaining, excuse me, and with everything on the line and it's easy formula, win three games and you're in. And they couldn't do that against one of the worst teams in the league, the easiest game on your entire schedule. There is no excuse for that. And that is where the distrust in fans right now is 100% warranted. Do you think, okay, do you think, does 10 and 7 get in the playoffs for this team? Yes, I'll, okay. I'll say that. I'll, so there is, there's hope, there's hope for the playoffs. If the Chargers can take care of business, I have confidence that I don't believe that either the Ravens or the Dolphins will win their final two games. I think that they will at least drop one. Okay. As long as the Chargers take care of business, their record should be able to have them back in, because that's what it is, back in to the seventh seed. <sighs> okay, Jake. Uh, we got through a lot today. A lot of this was just some feelings and emotions and curse words. <laughs> Do you it's feel all any better? we needed today? Do you Do feel, I feel any better? better? No. Me neither. <laughs> I don't no. feel no better. No. This this wasn't a therapy session. This was venting. So you know we're obviously going to get to the Denver Broncos matchup later on this week uh, because there's going to be certain players for out out for this game too that we already know about. But we'll do a full breakdown of that this uh, this coming week. As much as the Chargers needed this game against Houston, they need it even more now against this Denver Broncos team. So uh, we're going to see what happens. Today was a venting sesh. I'm glad that we got a chance to go through all the voicemails. We're all frustrated. We're all pissed. And it's all warranted. It's all warranted. It's what you do with it. What are the Chargers going to do with this? It's a million dollar question, my friend. We'll see what happens in the next couple of days. So from uh, myself and Dan Wolkenstein, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Appreciate it very much. Um, Sorry, this was not the enlightening podcast that we always believed it would be coming after a game against a three and 11 Houston's team. Unfortunately, we're on the other side of the spectrum today, but happy that we got through all these calls. Glad we vented together. Uh, I can't say that we're going to be better by the next time that uh, that we come out on the next week after this game. I'll just say, let's hope. Let's hope for the best, expect the worst, but let's ride or die with this team until they're done. They are not done yet, but still have faith. Bolt up, Bolt fan. We've been through a lot together over the past few decades, but we're going to go through a lot more together. I think things are looking up on the whole. For Jake Hefner, you can find him at Jake D. Hefner on Twitter, myself at Chargers Homer. Again, find us, subscribe, like, tune in, hit the bell notifications on all the places that you find your YouTube as well as anywhere you find your podcast. Um, have a great New Year's. I'm sure we're going to talk to you before that, but still, uh, enjoy the time with your loved ones. We still all have a ton to be grateful for. Enjoy the time we have, and we'll talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed.